know Father has spoken about absolute values. And we know that when you look at different religions and different societies, there are many, many different values, and they don't agree, and they don't agree. But Father's point of view is that uh, be beneath all of those, because we all come from a common parent, with a common design and a common intention, there are absolute common values that, in spite of all the differences, exist. And that's what the theory of axiology points out. What are those most essential values? Uh, education is how do we pass values on to our children. Uh, ethics is how do we relate with each other. Uh, art is how do we practice our creativity, our divine creativity. History is a theory of history which also many philosophers have dealt with. Why does history progress the way it does? Why do certain things happen in history? Well, we have a history too. And there are partial views of politics and economics which are not in the Unification Blood books, but which are in the End of Communism books that Dr. V also wrote. So what we'll be doing today is uh, um, looking at uh, at a few, um, just a, a few of those uh, uh, chapters, I'm going to pull out little gems from each chapter. So it, this is kind of like the digital equivalent of sitting down with a book and flipping to you know, pages that I bookmark. Right? That's what's going to be happening. By no means is this an exhaustive examination of unification thought. It's, it's really, it's, it's amazing. It's huge. So. Uh, let me, uh, oh yeah, this is Dr. Song Hun Lee, by the way. And that's, that's me back in the 80s in, in Athens, Greece. Dr. Lee, uh, you know, okay, you can see how tall I am. I'm actually taller than Dr. Lee, and right in that picture, he's wearing heels like this big. <laughs> so Dr. Lee, I feel he looks like a robot. You know, if he just had the little thing like that, you know, and, but his voice was really deep, really deep. You know, it was amazing how deep his voice was for, for a small man. But um, he, he really, really loves true parents. And he, uh, you know, very, 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 very deeply. So uh, this is one thing I learned about unification thought when I began to work with Dr. Lee directly, is that when I was reading the material, it came across as very intellectual. But once I was with Dr. Lee, I realized how much heart and love is behind this, this, these ideas, then that's what makes it come alive. Okay. So, are there any questions about uh, this introduction to unification thought? That, uh, that I just gave? Oh, that's a study guide that I made for Carp. It was signed by uh, Dr. Sook who, and Carp, and he brought it to Dr. Lee, and Dr. Lee signed it, and then he brought it to Father, and Father signed it. So I have uh, in, in the home one of my, my treasures, is a, a, a study guide for unification thought signed by Dr. So Dr. Lee and by Alvin. So that's cool. Okay, are there any questions before I get into it? Yes. Just sorry for my ignorance, but uh, did you just hear to explain the difference between agnostic and atheist? Okay, agnostic is someone who's not sure God exists and who's not sure that God doesn't exist. They don't know. They can't find enough proof to disprove the existence of God, but they also can't find enough proof to make them believe that God does exist. An atheist is someone who absolutely does not believe in God. And a militant atheist is really one who pushes that idea aggressively, that there is no God, and you shouldn't believe in God. Agnostic doesn't believe in God. Yes? Who is the person who initiated the level four? Chang Kwok. Well, I mean, father initiated, you know. But, uh, uh, oh yeah, it is, it is. Uh, I, I worked with, uh, with Reverend Kwok on that book. So uh, the, many of the diagrams on that book, or several of the diagrams on the book I actually, I actually um, created based upon his diagram, his pencil drawings. You know. So yeah, once upon a time, yeah. <laughs> so, okay. If that's, if that's all, then, then let me uh, get into the main body of what, I, what I'll talk about today. Uh, let's see, so from 12.45 to 1.25. Oh, I'm behind me. I'm going to talk about ontology. And ontology is the area of philosophy that talks about being. So when uh, um, Aristotle looked at the world, 
he tried to explain what are the basic elements in the world and how do things are related. When Lao Tzu looked at the world, he tried to understand what are the basic elements of the world, how do they exist, how do they in interrelate. So that's what ontolo ont uh, ontology deals with. Is it's a study of being, of existence. So we have an ontology, let's see. Um, uh, and uh, our ontology is, uh, uh, I, I find it unusual because we're not only human beings it's, it, looking at the world and trying to explain it, but Father is in a diff de very different position. He's not looking at the world and trying to figure, you know, trying to figure out what makes it tick. He it has a connection with God, you know. So. His, his uh, explanation of reality is based upon his dialogue, his understanding, his research, his observation, and his relationship with God. So that he has a very special way of looking at the world. Not only that, because of this relationship with God, he also is able to put forth a, uh, a, 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 um, an understanding of the original being. You know, not just being the existing world, but he's actually able to give us some kind of explanation of the original being, the being who created this world. So that is a little bit outstanding in our in unification thought. It has a theory not only of existing being, but of the original being. You know, um, uh, and then um, uh, we also Father has this position because he understands that human beings are very special then even though we are created beings, he has a there's a chapter that explains how we are, even though we are created beings, nevertheless we are very distinct from everything else that exists. We are in the image of God. We are divine beings. So therefore, we are not just animals, you know, uh, but rather we are uh, an entirely different category of existence. So there's created beings, there's the original being, and there's human beings. So there's a, there, there, there's a philosophy as well. Um, uh, so uh, everything has internal nature, external form. I'll be using the Korean term sung sung for internal nature because Dr. Lee does that consistently all throughout unification thoughts. So if I say sung sung, or you see SS, it means internal nature. If you see HS, it means external form. Right? But I'll be saying. And then, uh, so everything in the universe has uh, uh, sung song and yung song. Everything in the universe has yang and yin. Uh, but we'll look at uh, 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 those uh, a little bit. Now, the thing that I wanted to talk about, I'm going to go. I'm going to. I'm going to talk about all these three chapters in the next 35 minutes before we take our discussion. <laughs> I, I, you know. Okay, that's 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 where I that's why I have to choose only a little bit of tidbits. So I got this little idea that I'm going to share a flow of how to tie all these three things together. So I'm going to skip over a lot of stuff. Um, what I want to talk about is the, the divine character of God, and uh, the divine character of God. This is a. Um, you'll notice that in divine principle it says that the, the Asia understands. Yang and Yin, and the great ultimate. This is in chapter one. But it doesn't understand that God is a God of personality. And so uh, this goes a little bit more clearly into what that is. And so what I'm going to talk about right now in the next five minutes or four minutes is the, the most fundamental understanding of the nature of God. Uh, Catholicism, where I come from, and many, many uh, uh, other religions have different attributes of God. God is all-powerful, God is all-knowing, God is all-present, you know, all these different things, uh, omniscient, God knows, whatever. But Father says, okay, but the most fundamental attributes of God that we need to understand really are that God is a God of heart, God is a God of, God of logos, and God is a creativity. And those are the most important things to understand about God. Now, let me explain or let me share with you the unification thought definition of heart because when I joined the movement I heard about artistic this, artistic that, heart, 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 you know, it's like heart everything, you know. <laughs> and, but I didn't know what it was. But this is, the, this is actually the definition. Heart is the emotional impulse to seek joy through love. Heart is the emotional impulse to seek joy through love. 
heart is an irrepressible desire that wells up from within. It's not possible to repress the impulse to seek joy. The impulse to seek love is stronger than the impulse to seek joy. The impulse of love is primary. <coughs> So thus, God's heart can be also be expressed as the emotional impulse to love infinitely. God's most basic characteristic, which he cannot repress, is this emotional impulse to love infinitely. Okay, everybody should go under a waterfall and meditate on that for three years. <laughs> I think it's really, it's so simple, and yet it's, it, it's something that, you know, from all our theology and everything, we, all these volumes and volumes, we miss. We, but this is the most simple thing. It's like the, the God that Albert and was real to us is a very simple person, being. Uh, uh, unification thought explains that uh, this emotional impulse Uh, it wells up from the bottom of the mind. It's irrepressible even for God himself. It's irrepressible. So I really do think about that, and I would like you to, you know, sometime to really think about that. Because this is not your normal picture of God, you know? We, for, for thousands of years, we have this picture of God as being a, this huge, immensely powerful person on the throne who calls the shots. Always, you know, <coughs> just directing everything. But this is a different picture. It's a, it's a God, okay, he is all powerful. He's all amazing and imaginative and all those kind of things. But at bottom, he is impelled by this desire that he cannot repress. He cannot, he, there's nothing he can do about it. <laughs> he needs to experience the give and take of love. It's the only way that you can feel joy. Now that is really challenging, especially if you're a classic or an atheist. But if you work with that idea, as I have, you know, it, 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 um, it has really changed my, my picture of life and, 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 and my, this, this relationship that I have with my heavenly parent. Just to, just to reduce it to that point, you know. But this is, is this true? You know, is this true? Heavenly parent. I mean, this makes you look like you know, you're so vulnerable. And, and is this, could it possibly be that you can't repress this? That this, this impulse governs even you? And there's nothing you can do about it? And the answer I get back is yes. <laughs> it is. Sorry, I'll try to stay near the mic, but it's a little bit hard. I get tired of waiting. Okay. Um, all right. So then, because God is impelled, and he, thank you very much, he must have an object of love. Then I want to show you this diagram of uh, of um, the internal nature of the external uh, form of um, any unification thought. Okay. So. The, the, the external form, the, the human song of God is called actually pre-energy. Because as you know, the, the energy of this world cannot be the body of God. Cannot be the external form of God. This is resultant, right? So there's a pre-energy, and there's two forms in this pre-energy. God has a, a desire to make things, and then he has a desire to give them life so that they can interact and exist, interact, and multiply. So then, the, the, this pre-matter then become, uh, this desire to form things becomes pre-matter, and this pre-matter somehow is transformed into the actual matter and en energy and matter in the physical universe. I understand that somebody asked Father, well, please give us the, 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 the formula, this, the, the explanation of how pre-matter becomes matter. And I, I understand that Father said, the answer is being approached through quantum physics. 
And that's, that, so that's all I know. Don't ask me that question. How does free matter become matter? Apparently, we're on the right track. You know, and I, I understand that there's even something beyond quantum physics. But um, uh, anyway, the metaphysics of it is, is yet to be discovered and understood. But the other thing is that matter is kind of is inert until energy is put into it, and that's what universal prime force is. Universal prime force is the energy that God puts into living things in order that it can exist, that they can interact and that they can multiply. And um, um, so the reason this all come about is because an object partner of love was absolutely necessary for God. And this creation was necessary, inevitable, and can never be considered as merely accidental. Um, I have so many hyperlinks here. Okay, now, so, in the creation of the object, I want to show you something. We're going to skip over to the next chapter, which is the theory of ontology. And I discovered something in ontology which continually is amazing to me. And just check this out. It says, in conceptualizing, God immediately and comprehensively formed the conception of a human being as a complete unitary whole with all the relevant attributes. In other words, sung sang yin sang yang and yin. Moreover, the conception that came to God's mind was not that of a man and a woman in the abstract. You know, the male species and the female species, of the species. Not, no. Moreover, uh, um, but rather that of a specific man, Adam, and a specific woman, Eve, with their concrete individual images, namely the very ideas of Adam and Eve. Uh, another expression of it is here. And it's from an earlier book, which, uh, which I really like, because it was written mainly for members. And, um, and uh, so it wasn't cleaned up for presentation to, to non-members. And this is from uh, Explaining Unification Thought, 1983. Check this out. The image of man, therefore, was the first to be created in the mind of God, and was the standard for all other images. The original individual image of man in the mind of God before the creation of the universe was none other than the image of Adam himself. It was not vague, it was not abstract, but it was very specific and concrete. Adam's image had both a spiritual and a physical aspect. Of course, Adam's individual character and appearance also were included in the original uh, individual image. And then God thought of another human, and the new hum image had additional aspects of the new individual character, leaving out Adam's individuality. Well, <laughs> what you've just read is saying that God alone, whatever that means, uh, needed an object of love. And so, when God imagined the first thing to create that would satisfy this object of love, he did not think of the universe. He did not think of the Milky Way galaxy. He did not think of animals. He did not think of the human species. He thought of one young man. Very precise in that the boy's external form and in his internal character. Very precise. It says here, uh, not abstract, not vague, very concrete, spiritual and physical. So this young man, his personality, his character, were conceived of in the mind of God so that God would receive ultimate joy from the way this person was on the inside. And then he, he, he designed the, the physical appearance of this young man. You know, the height, the weight, the shape of the eyebrows, you know, the length of the nose, the, you know, I mean, everything. Every single detail of this human being. Why? Because he, he didn't want, you know, the human species, a generic thing, and okay, let's see what's going to happen. No, he needed an object of love, that, and, and so he, he knew exactly what he wanted to receive joy back from this person, and that's what he put into this design for this young man. And then he did the same thing, according to this particular account of the young woman. I've heard other accounts where he designed them simultaneously. And sometimes I've heard some people say that he designed that woman, woman first. Okay, I'm not sure which is the right one, but the point is, before the creation of the universe, the very first thing in the mind of God was one young man and one young woman, very specific in their internal nature and their external form. And then, and then, once he had that, next, God subtracted certain qualities and elements from the concept of the human being and transformed it 
for why he created the conceptions of the various animals. And then he, he subtracted uh, the concept, the, the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, and, he, and by simplifying that, he created the plants. And furthermore, he, uh, uh, he subtracted uh, certain qualities and elements from the concept of the plant that transformed, by, whereby he developed the conceptions of the various heavenly bodies and the minerals. So this is called the downward process of conception. You're not going to get this in science class, no matter how many doctorates you ever get. You know, this is remarkable. You know, I'm not saying you absolutely have to believe this, but think about it. That's all I'm asking. Think about it. Consider this. Father teaches this. Father believes this. This is what he has discovered. This is what. I can, I, you know, I can say that God told me you know, that, that if a God is a God of heart and he needed an object of, 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 of affection and, and relationship with, he designed these two young people. And once he had this amazing design for these two young people, then he said, now, where are they going to live? You know, I, they, need, they need this and they need that. And not only do they need to survive, they need to experience beauty. And they, they need to realize just how much I love them. So he's going to make this amazing, amazing universe. And so he simplifies and gets the ideas of animals, simplifies and gets the ideas for plants, simplifies, gets the ideas for minerals and solar systems. And then, once the whole thing is designed, boom! Big Bang. <laughs> the Big Bang happens. And then for the next 16 to 20 billion years, there's the unfolding as the gases just come out from this one place and they begin to cool down, coalesce, form planets, simple life forms, and then 16 to 20 billion years later is the, the human, human appears. Right? Now, I, I, I really, um, normally I like to talk a long time about this, but I'm I, so I, I you know, just think about that, okay? <laughs> you know, just remember what I said. But that's how the universe came about. It came about as an idea of two people who could be loved and could love back. And then everything else was created. And then once the whole thing was designed, and the Big Bang happens. You know, this is an amazing explanation. It's not implausible. You see, that's the thing about it. Well, of course, you know, how could, pe many people have tried to propose why the universe unfolds it as it does. And they put forth many theories. Why not this one? It's, you know, it, it's, it's reasonable. That I know how people, that I know how I design things. That's how I do it, you know? And then I, then I, and then I start the creative process by some action. So uh, an interesting book is um, uh, The Language of God, written by um, a, a, a Stephen Collins, who recently won the, uh, relatively recently won the Nobel Prize, the Nobel Prize for Sequencing the Human Genome. He started that activity as, a, as an atheist, and by the time he was done sequencing the human genome, he had become an absolute, you know, a theist. Matter of fact, he became Christian. <laughs> anyway, but, um, so, but, uh, okay, so, uh, the, the language of God, uh, and he, he has a talk on, his name is Collins, and he, he teaches at some university, uh, he's, he's alive and he's not an ancient guy. He's, uh, he's, he's, and, and, and he, it's on the New York Times bestseller list because he knows how to write for people in language that's very understandable. Okay, I, I'll show you a couple of things here. So this upward process. Oh, this is from the language of God. And, and so Collins, <coughs> if God is outside of nature, then he is outside of space and time. In that context, God could, in the moment of creation of the universe, also know every detail of the future. That can include the formation of the stars, the planets, the galaxies, all of the chemistry, physics, geology, and biology that led to the formation of life on Earth and the evolution of humans right to the moment of you reading this book. Because God is not limited by the tyranny of linear time, I, um, I hope you, you know, I can't, uh, I can't go too far into the world, so I'll go way over my own. Uh, um, oh, 
when Adam and Eve, you know, when, when Adam and Eve appeared at the end of 16 to 20 billion years, if you realize that God made all this for these two young people, this is a little thing from uh, Chen Sang Yang that really was poignant. Second, the union of a husband and wife represents the final stage of God's creation of the universe. Therefore, the unity of husband and wife signifies the completion of the creation of the universe. The unity of a husband and a wife is the, is the completion of the universe. This doesn't have a, a reason for existing until that young man and that young woman come together. Not just the first man and woman, but everyone else. The universe is completed by our appearance you know, and by our marriage. <laughs> Whoa! Uh, and the last one uh, it's, that I find extremely just. If God had been thinking, Transcendium, if God had been thinking only about himself, would he have created heaven and earth? Creation requires an investment of energy. An artist's great hope is to create a masterpiece. An artist invests all of his effort into making great works of art. A masterpiece appears only when the artist gives everything and feels he cannot give any more. A masterpiece appears only when the artist gives everything and he feels he can't give any more. Creation starts with investing in itself. Creation is possible only when energy is poured out. Without contributing energy, there is no result. According to the principle that a perfect object partner appears only through total investment, God is the subject partner completely invested himself into making his object partner. Uh, how much did God invest? Some people think that when God created through the word saying, let there be this, let there be that, it's like a game. But no, God completely put out his true life, his true love, his true ideals. We don't love something unless we have worked hard and invested our flesh and blood into it. That's what went into the design of this world and this universe. He exhausted himself. There was nothing left. Nothing left. He could do no better. Before creating God, thought about everything set there on himself and the joy he would receive. But after starting to create, he existed for his object partner. We don't exist for ourselves, but for our partners, for our sons, for our daughters. That's how it is. So that's, you know, God exists for us. That is what the Father is saying. So this picture of, of, I mean, people who don't believe in God are still blown away by the beauty of this universe and the chemistry and the physics and the math. And it's, it's incredible. And the human organism, all this, Everything that makes everything live and work and interact, and, um, uh, and but that's what that's why it is the way it is because that's how much was put into it. Okay. I'm so sorry. You know, I'm <laughs> really really short. Uh, okay. So ontology. And the last thing I wanted to conclude with uh, before uh, taking the break was, uh, oh, I'm on time. I have until 1.25. Okay, we're good. Man. I don't have to rush my head off. The last thing I would like to explain about ontology is, uh, is um, uh, human beings. Uh, now, you, you have to understand that uh, I'm going so fast, and, and I'm so tempted. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw out one, I'm gonna take a chance and try to squeeze this in. Um, uh, yang and yin. You know, you, we've all heard about yang and yin. So, uh, unification thought says that God made yang and yin as attributes of Sun Sang and Yun Sang in order to express uh, harmony and beauty through yang and yin. Uh, I'm gonna run this by you very fast, but it's so beautiful I don't wanna let it go by. God's creation can be compared to the creation of a great work of art in which Yang and Yin are in harmony. That is, it can be said that God has been conducting a grand symphony entitled The Creation of Heaven and Earth. God started with the Big Bang and created the galaxies, the solar system, and the Earth. 
On the earth he created plants, animals, family, human beings, and playing with a symphony. Various yangs and yins are operating in the high and low notes, strong and weak notes, long and short sounds, yang instruments, yin instruments. In a similar way, in the process of creating the universe, various yangs and yins are considered to have been in work. What this means is that yang and yin are actually secondary attributes. They modify the internal nature and the external form of things. That's what that means. But you now this and this is where the wonder, you know, I've heard that and you know it didn't really mean anything to me until I until unification brought brought this to my attention. Now, think about how many species of things there are. Uh, insects, plants, fungi, lichens, protozoa, chilicerates, mollusks, crustaceans, worms, fish, flatworms, uh, reptiles, birds, uh, jellyfish, sponges, mammals, bacteria. All of these, they all have internal nature and external form. Every single one of them has internal nature and external form. Then how does God create these different species? Actually, by modifying the external form of these things with yang and yin. And by mo modifying the internal character of all of these things with yang and yin. That's how you get animals with different personalities. That's how you get uh, trees with different shapes or different species of trees. Or, or, or simply by, by the combination of taking the external form of, of something and modifying it. You know what a graphic equalizer is? It has all these uh, uh, frequencies that you can raise and lower and open up. So the, 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 I, I, I imagine that there's a, a board for all of the variables that go into a, a human being or anything else. And then the way that, you know, how's God going to design an elephant? Well, he's going to take the nose slider and go all the way up. And how is he going to design the nose of a, of a bulldog? He's going to take the nose slider and bring it all the way down. You know? <laughs> and, and the legs and, and, and the length of the hair and the, 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 you know, the, how deep the eyes are or how, how much they are. All of this, just innumerable variables. That, that you can modify the external form and the internal with it. How do you do that? Simply with all of these yang and yin settings. And that's how the variety of this universe comes about. All of these things, that, 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 this is from National Geographic, all of these species, they all have yang and yin. They all have uh, internal nature and external form. And how does God create these different species and their behaviors? Simply by modifying the external form and the internal nature with yang and yin. Uh, so these are scarab beetles, you know. You can see that, okay, there's a, there's a basic model for a beetle, but then when you take length and color and shininess and uh, uh, different parts of the body, these different sliders, more yang, more yin, then you create all these, these different things. And then the same thing is true with these doggies, right? You get, you, uh, um, you can get amazing variation uh, among, among these different species in their personality and character and in their external form simply by modifying the yang and yin. Now isn't that wondrous? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> when I realized that, that that's actually how the variety of this universe came about, I was blown away by the magnificence of such a simple design. And you know, I said, holy cow! <laughs> Is that how you did all of this? Simply by playing around with yang and yin? And some and some some and some, some. That's how you did it. Yeah. <laughs> like it? Hey, it's amazing. It blows my mind. It's incredible. <laughs> There's more to it. You haven't even seen the beginning. Oh wow! You know. But but isn't that something that you think of the, how the universe is, how the, the variety of, uh, of things, and it's all just simply because of some some and some and then and then. That's it. God created everything in this universe just by time. How brilliant is that? I mean, it's, there's no words for it. And why did he do it? Because of love. He exhausted himself because of love. So um, that, that's the, the, the little sidetrack that I, 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 was, I wasn't going to do, but I just had to do because I, I had more time than I thought. OK, now the thing that I, I do want to close on is, is the, the uh, human being. Um, and. Uh, this is something I learned from uh, Dr. Sebastian Matchak, uh, my philosophy professor in unification thought. And Dr. Matchak was a Jesuit. He taught philosophy. And when he was a young man in Poland, he went to the seminary with the man who became Pope John Paul. So St. Uh, uh, 
the, Dr. Matrak taught philosophy at St. John's University, so if you know college basketball, you know St. John's University. Um, but he, he taught there, and he also taught at seminary. And this is what he thought when he looked at Father's uh, Divine Principle of Unification taught in VOC. He, he said, uh, as a scholar assessing Father's teaching, uh, by the way, he was never blessed. I don't know if he, if he accepted Father as uh, the Messiah. I don't know, maybe uh, Reverend Larry, you might know. But, um, anyway, this was his objective assessment of Father's teaching and stature. The, no the novelty of unification philosophy and its application to Christian teaching lies, first of all, in its new ontology resulting from the concept of man. For unificationists, man becomes the starting point of our knowledge of the whole of reality. He becomes also a creature of supreme dignity, second only to God, and the relative center of all of, uh, of reality, God being its absolute center. The unification understanding of man, therefore, leads to an understanding of the whole of reality, even of God. This is the thing that really knocked my socks off. Man becomes a creature of supreme dignity, second only to God. Holy cow, they didn't tell me that on NFT. <laughs> I mean, you know, in the age of restoration, admittedly, I mean, I, 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 when I came out of college, my hair was down to here, and I, you know, and, uh, and I really needed to be uh, educated that I was fallen and I had fallen nature and I had to uh, restore that and do indemnity to restore all that. But the teachings of Father d do make this very clear that human beings are creatures of supreme dignity, second only to God. It's in the books. It's in the books. And especially in this age of Chang Yoga, in the age of settlement, post foundation day. I think this is really something that we really need to understand in our minds and in our hearts, that we are beings of supreme dignity, second only to God. This makes a difference in the way you live your life. I know, I try. You know, I studied all the philosophers and I was, a, I was a cool existentialist and a cynic and a pessimist, so cool. And what did it lead, what kind of life did that lead me to? What kind of choices did it lead me to? What kind of relationship did it lead me to? Actually, I was arrogant, SOB, and I wasn't proud of myself at all. I was, that was me. You know. But then to come to this viewpoint where I am a being of supreme dignity, of supreme dignity second only to God, man, does that make a difference? It's not just here, it's the way I live. It's the way I look at, look at all, all of us. Right? So anyway. Now, uh, I wanted to get to one point in the theory of original human nature. Um, there's so much here again. Um, and, and one point that I, I, I made, it, it was made this morning, that we are beings of individuality. So maybe if there's a little bit of time, I can go a little bit more deeply into that. But the thing I did want to talk about is what yang and yin means in human, in human beings. And this will be the one, one, probably the, the last thing before we break. So I want to skip to the, uh, the, to the section called A Being with Divine Image. We are made in the image of God. We have uh, an internal nature, an external form like God. Uh, we, we also are beings of heart, heart and, and logos and creativity like, like God. But Yang and Yin is the one that really kind of uh, blew my mind, I suppose because I'm a romantic, you know. Uh, but by the way, that's what I heard cynics are. If you, I heard someone say, if you scratch the skin of a bitter cynic, what you will find is a frustrated idealist. You know? And I was the bitterest of cynics, wow. you know, most, most pessimistic of all. Why? Because I was such a frustrated idealist and romantic. And now I can be all the idealist and all the romantic I want. Oh boy! <laughs> you know? I'm liberated! I feel, you know. Okay. Okay, harmonious being of yang and yin. For human beings, yang and yin coming together is an amazing, amazing thing. Why? Because, because it's, uh, uh, the coming together of yang and yin for human beings, uh, the highest expression is intermarriage. So what is the significance of a, a matrimonial union, a principal couple? First of all, it's the manifestation of God. A man and woman together bless the marriage of the manifestation of God. Look at that. 
a husband and wife each originally. Can you actually see that writing in the back row? Not, not so much. Okay. A husband and wife originally represents one of God's dual characteristics of yang and yin. So the man represents yang, the woman represents yin. Accordingly, when they come together, that's when you see God. That's when God is manifested. Um, So in, in Corinthians, God, St. Paul talks about the temple, each individual being a temple. But here's the Father's definition or, or um, uh, insight into what the temple means. Even though God is God, he has no, relating, no way of relating to the world other than through Adam and Eve. Uh, they are the base for him to relate to their sons and daughters. Adam and Eve are the base for God to relate to the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. Uh, God's purpose in creating human beings was to assume a form. Therefore, Adam and Eve were to be the external God. That's actually what it means, you know. Mind and God become one set of divine God, become one with God, temple of God. Um, you feel God's heart is your own, basically. Um, they, so, they were to be the external God. They would represent his dual characteristics of man, masculinity and femininity. He would enter and dwell within them. God's home is in the core of our hearts. Adam and Eve, the original human ancestors, were to be the visible God. Right? That's what this is going to. That's what the principle. So when when Alvin and Manolan give us the blessing, that's actually what our blessing is. Ideally, we should be the manifestation. That's what we're shooting for. So when a husband and wife love each other horizontally, um, centering on God, his vertical love dwells there, and life is created through the multiplication of love. God can, can create a new human life through that, through that, through that young man, through that young woman. So this is there are four actually. Uh, significances of the matrimonial couple, but this first one is really something that uh, I really like us to think about. You know, uh, uh, those of us who came up in the wilderness, we know that our blessings were, were for restoration and indemnity. That's why we were married to, uh, you know, opposing personalities and opposing nations. And Albanim was Albanim and Obanim were hoping that we would fix the problem right away <coughs> by loving each other and and and. and uh, and making beautiful, beautiful children as a result of our victory. Right? So you, you, you know, you know what our success rate. You, know, you can measure your own selves. You can, you know, your brothers, your sisters, our friends, how we've done in that department. But anyway, this is the ideal. It remains the ideal. It doesn't change. So I would really, um, okay, I. Uh, so but I, I really feel like uh, when people are, are, are black, matched and blessed going forward. You know, whether they're young first gens who join in LA, you know, college, or you know, our second, third, fourth gen, this is the way they should look at their marriage, their matching and blessing. It is, it is to be your to, to be a manifestation of God when you find it. That's what your destiny is, to be a manifestation of God. And all of us guys, you know, let's keep trying. You know, let's not give up yet, you know. <laughs> So, and the, the second one is, uh, it's the completion of the creation of the universe. Uh, the husband, oops, um, uh, the union of husband and wife, wow, uh, represents the final stage of God's creation of the universe. Our uh, human beings were created to be the rulers of all things, but neither a man alone nor a woman alone can become a ruler. Only by being perfected as a couple, um, that is, as husband and wife can they become the rulers of all things. Only then will the creation of the universe be completed. I'm going to close by showing you a painting done by my neighbor, Benny Anderson. Uh, and he, he has done some of the paintings in Chumbo, uh, in, uh, in, um, uh, in, in, in uh, oh. Chandra Gurm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, so this is a painting that, that I feel summarizes uh, that. Uh, these ideas, that we are the manifestation of God, we are the creation of the, completion of the creation of the universe. 
you obviously see a yang and yin there, right? Anybody look closely, and those of you who have seen it before, don't raise your hand. But um, uh, look closely at the yang and yin, and, and tell me if you see something more in the... Oh boy. Well, you can only make it out. Thank you. Can, you, can anybody notice something in the yang? Anything in the yin? Okay. Um, you see, here is the hairline of the young man, his forehead, his eyebrow, his eye, his nose, his lips, his chin, his throat. That's a young man. And then over here is the hairline, and the forehead, and the eye, and the nose, and the lips, and the chin, and the throat of a young woman. Look, look at... I'm sorry, brothers and sisters. Those of you who are behind me are, can't see the TV screen. But anyway, the point is that I think you know they say a picture is worth a thousand words, and I think that picture really summarizes what a blessed couple should really be. Can you understand? Like we are the manifestation of God. So sometimes when my wife and I we go walking in the park, and we see an old couple. Uh, we live. Uh, we share a park with Fort Lee, New Jersey. Fort Lee, there's there's uh, many uh, 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 Korean couples, and so many people. So sometimes we see an old man, you know, walking with a cane, and next to him is a, an old woman, you know, she's walking in, in his arm very, very slowly. Um, and these people, I imagine, they've been through life, and they've been through all the things that life can. Maybe they've been through the Korean War. Who knows what they've been through? Their children, uh, uh, grandchildren, uh, life, and maybe even the, the death. They've been through everything, and there they are. And sometimes, when I, knowing this part of the divine principle, I look at that and I'm, I'm thinking, that's what God is. So, that's something I wanted to share. And so the last thing is my favorite quote from the divine principle, which is, it's on page 30 of the divine principle. And it, it's, it, it's about this. The place where Adam and Eve become perfectly one in heart and body is the, uh, is the place where God, the subject partner giving love and human beings, the object partners returning beauty become united. This is the center of goodness where the purpose of creation is fulfilled. Here God, our parent, draws near and abides within his perfected children and rests peacefully for eternity. The place where Adam and Eve become one in heart and body is the place where the purpose of creation is fulfilled. And this is where God can come to us. And He can draw near to us and rest with us peacefully for eternity. The place where Adam and Eve, you and I, where a, a blessed man and a blessed woman come together in mind and body is the place where God, everything that He ever one is completed. And he can come and he can rest peacefully for eternity there. So I have this little image in my head that um, I, I will be, uh, I have a little cabin somewhere, you know, somewhere beautiful. You know, now that I'm in Pasadena, I'm thinking maybe I should be here, you know. Um, but someplace really beautiful, I can see the sky, I can see the, the, the water, and uh, I'll have a little a quiet dinner with my wife, and there's a little table in between us with a with a rose in the middle and candles on either side of the road, and there's a fireplace. And by the fireplace is a lounge, a chaise lounge, and, and my, my wife and I will prepare you know, a nice romantic dinner. And, I'll, and I want to say, the Heavenly Parent, we prepared this for you. So please come and be with us. You, know, you, put it, you made her, you made me, you put us together, you gave us all that we have, all that we are. I know you've had a bad day. I don't even have to ask. I don't even have to ask how bad your day has been. So I have nothing to tell you. We have nothing to say to you. We have no advice to give you. You know more than we could ever know. So if you want to come and you want to rest and you want to sit in that lounge and all you want to do is kick back and close your eyes, put your feet up, please come. Please, please, please come. And if you don't want us to talk to you, we won't talk to you. But we know you're here. We want you here. Just be here. Just, 
chill for, for however long you need, and then you leave when you need to. But I want to be able to make my marriage this, for having me there, you understand? So I really feel we, we don't understand the value and the beauty of our own blessings. I feel that. And uh, I really feel that um, we, we should, and I hope you remember this, I hope you don't forget it, that you don't, you know, from this day that you know, my lecture will be over and then there's you know, two more hours and this and whatever. But I hope you don't forget this point about your blessing. And those of you who will be managed and who will be blessed, I hope that you remember this. That this is what your marriage and blessing can be, the place where you become one in mind and body. It's amazing, amazing, sacred, sacred, sacred. 